How's it going, all you beautiful people? Let me begin by first apologizing for the lack of videos lately. I recently made the move from New Jersey to Wisconsin, and I've been busy consuming vast amounts of cheese and beer. I mean moving. I've been busy moving. <clears throat> But recently, movie theaters made the decision to re-release all of the original Spider-Man movies, and I just couldn't resist checking out the film that was instrumental in building my childhood. I also thought that this would be the golden opportunity to start a new series on my channel focused on discussing my favorite flicks of all time. This aptly named Why I Love series of videos will take a closer look at my all-time favorites, less of analytical discussions of each pick and more of celebrations for each one. So without further ado, let's talk about... Now, I fully acknowledge that I'm not breaking any new ground here. Throw a rock and you'll find a video essay relating to the Spider-Man movies directed by Sam Raimi on this lovely site. All I can contribute is my personal connection to the story and why it means so much to me. Growing up, I loved comic books. Heck, I still do. To me, they're modern-day mythology, and they can serve as a great medium for telling morality tales but in interesting ways, and no character can be used as effectively in this way as the Wallcrawler can. Well, except for maybe my favorite comic hero of all time, but Spider-Man is also great. Spider-Man was a staple of my childhood. Heck, I'm shocked I didn't wear out my GameCube with the amount of times I played Ultimate Spider-Man. While I may have thought characters like Batman were cooler, I always found the most connection with that awkward teenager from Queens, and my love for the character all started with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. This was the first comic book movie I ever saw in theaters, though I have very little memory of the experience given that I was only five years old. But I can distinctly remember the power this film had in the time after its release. The toys, the lunchboxes, the breakfast cereals, it was truly a seminal moment in my life as a comic fan. There are a few notable points in superhero movie history. Richard Donner's Superman in 78, Burton's Batman in 89, an X-Men film strangely made without a director in 2000, and of course, Raimi's Spider-Man two years later. But while X-Men seemed to approach its subject material with a sense of embarrassment, Raimi wholeheartedly embraced comic books, and the love he has for the genre is practically oozing in every frame. Should I use the word oozing? Eh, it's fine. The moment Danny Elfman's god-tier score kicks in during the opening credits, you know you're in for something special, and that feeling is carried throughout the duration of this two-hour movie. W wait, wait, hang on, hang on. This is only two hours long? In just 121 minutes, we are shown a fully fleshed out origin for this character, as well as multiple relationship dynamics that change in a variety of ways by the story's conclusion? Now that's what I call efficient storytelling. Yeah, you can tell this is made by the same writer from Jurassic Park, alright. Oh, he lives in Wisconsin too. That's neat. And I know I mentioned the relationships already, but it's important to hit on this, as Spider-Man comics are, at the heart of it, character dramas. The connections shared between Peter Parker and the rest of the players in this story are one of the reasons why it remains so memorable throughout the years. We are shown the warm feeling of the Parker home in stark contrast to the cold and uninviting atmosphere of the Osborne house, both environments telling you everything you need to know about our protagonist and our antagonist respectively, and illustrating why each of these characters go down the path they'll eventually go on once they get the powers. And of course, none of these dynamics would work without a stellar cast, which of course this movie has. Tobey Maguire is perfectly suited to bring this version of the character to life. He's awkward, he's brilliant, and he makes mistakes. Gee, I miss when fictional heroes actually felt human. I can't imagine another actor playing this version of the character. James Franco gives his best performance as Harry Osborn. You can tell as the franchise went on he became increasingly checked out, but here, he's great. As is Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane Watson. I'm tired of all the hate she gets as this character. If you actually watch the movie, it's clear that she's struggling with an abusive home life, and the toxic relationships that she pursues is a direct result of this. She begins to genuinely fall for Peter as he's the only human being who actually takes an interest in her life. Harry tries his best, but his gut reaction in trying to help her following a traumatic event is saying that he'll buy her something. But that's only because of his toxic relationship with his father, because everyone in this movie is fully developed. 
Heck, Harry gets more development in this quick 30 second car scene with his dad than Ned got in three films. Remember Ned? That cardboard cutout who didn't have a single distinguishable character trait? T yeah, neither do I. But there's two characters in that car, because now it's time to talk about Willem flipping Defoe as the Green Goblin. I'm thankful No Way Home got to showcase more of Defoe as Norman to general audiences, but truth be told, he's always been phenomenal as this character. Wait, he was also born in Wisconsin? Alright, what's going on here? The theme of the film is, with great power comes great responsibility, and Norman is the antithesis of this notion. Here is a man seemingly devoid of any sense of responsibility and craves only power. And the moment he gets it, he begins to want even more of it. And the fact that another person who also has this kind of power is going around using it to help others just gets under his skin. So much so that it becomes his sole purpose in life to kill him and everything he loves. Look man, I love Alfred Molina as Doc Ock, but for my money, this is my favorite Spider-Man movie villain. And do I even have to talk about the greatest casting decision ever made in the history of comic book films? No? We're all in agreement it's perfect? Alright, great, moving on. But look, we can talk about the characters, we can talk about the script, we can talk about the score, but this project lives or dies by its director. And there's a reason why fans refer to this trilogy as the Raimi movies and not the Maguire movies. Because Sam Raimi is the real star here. This lovable dork genius got his start in the Evil Dead franchise, another series of films that also have a special place in my heart. He has a passion for the stories he's trying to tell, and with Spider-Man, he aimed to bring the golden age of comic books to the silver screen. I've said it before and I'll say it again, tone is the most crucial element in filmmaking. And the way Raimi balanced tone here is astounding. We go from laughing at the intentionally cheesy comedic moments, to crying at the emotional scenes, to wanting to jump out of our seats at the heroic achievements. It's comparable to the way David Lynch was able to balance tones in Twin Peaks. Like, <laughs> it's genuinely amazing. Raimi also brings so much life to New York City. Superheroes are always trying to save their respective cities, but here we are shown native New Yorkers who each have their own distinct personalities. Even people who just have one line stand out. It might not seem like much, but populating the location of your story with unique and likable characters makes us as an audience want to see them get saved. New York doesn't feel like a dull and gray CGI backdrop here. It's a fully fleshed out place. And speaking of saving people, oh boy there's some spectacular action sequences here. Web swinging has a true sense of momentum, and the way the crew was able to use cameras in effective creative ways is commendable. That part where Peter pursues his uncle's killer with the score popping off, ooh that's cinema baby! And who could forget that final battle? Every punch, every hit, it freaking hits. Blood is spurting from our hero's face. It's down, it's dirty. God, I wish comic book films could be this raw again. But look, cool action means nothing in a movie if we can't connect to a sense of emotion that the story's trying to tell. And this film, as well as its sequel, has the most heart I've ever seen from movies of this genre. This is a big reason why I wanted to make this video, as soulless superhero films continue to get churned out by studios with an assembly line-like fashion, getting the chance to rediscover this gem felt like finding water in the desert. Or Dr. Pepper in this case. We've seen some great comic book movies in the last few decades, but none compared to Raimi's timeless origin tale, save for a few. I've seen a lot of talk regarding the genre dying out, much like the western genre did, but those people going around saying this seem to forget that we still get westerns today. Some very great ones, in fact. As long as there are talented creatives at the helm who have a genuine passion for the project they're trying to bring to life, we will continue to see quality stories, and this film should be an example to follow.